Good evening, everyone, or good day, depending on what time you're listening to this podcast or watching this video. Uh, welcome to another episode of the First World Manila podcast. My name is Ramon Rodrigo Cuenca, CFA. I am the founder and director of First World Manila. First World Manila, for all of you who are just uh, kind of jumping in now, is a brand that makes that's using fine art, podcasting, and YouTube vlogging to make economic and urban development policies interesting to a wider audience here in Manila and in the Philippines. So yeah, and when I say economic and urban development, I'm specifically talking about Manila and to a certain, to a certain extent, the Philippines. Okay, uh, this episode is about the upcoming Metro Manila Rail Network that's being planned by the current uh, Duterte administration. Um, hold on, I have my earphones on. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, last week, I attended a talk at a co-working space called Clockworks. That's in the Makati Stock Exchange. That's the co-working space there. They were having this talk, and it, the, the talk, the presentation was being given by the Undersecretary of Railways, uh, Mr. T.J. Batan. I think I say how you pronounce it, and he was just talking about just giving his thoughts basically or or what's what's what the what the government rationale is for their their plans for building a railway network because um that's one of the that's one of the government's initiatives right now is to create a a decent railway network uh in metro manila and the philippines so the presentation was called the future of mega manila's railways so obviously since I'm all into uh, covering these types of things for this podcast I attended. So without further ado, let's get into it. Um, I'm, I'm obviously just going to give you guys, you know, just a, some of the key points of his presentation. It was over an hour long and there was a QA and a afterwards. Uh, but I just want to give you guys just the basics, just to understand what they're, where uh, the government's coming from with, what, with their railway project. And maybe also my thoughts on, on the whole thing. Or, or certain aspects of it. Okay, so uh, Mr. Batan gave, started with a few, basically a few historical uh, points about railways in the Philippines. Um, actually, he actually, no, actually he started with uh, the government's explicit goal is to increase operational railways in the Philippines from currently 77 kilometers to 1,900 by 2022. And from here, he sort of talked about some of the historical background for Philippine railways. Uh, there was actually a lot more railway coverage before. We actually have one of the oldest railways in Asia, second to India. It was established, the, rail, the railway network here was established in 1892. And at its height, it had over, or it had around 2,300 kilometers of operational railway. So, I mean, there was actually like a decent, basically there was a decent railway network before in the Philippines, before uh, the war. I'm assuming uh, before World War II, where a lot of it was destroyed. Uh, I don't know how many of you watched uh, General Luna a few years ago, but I remember there was one scene where there were, uh, General Luna and his forces were hiding in a, the railway, the railway, um, some, one of the railway carts. And then that, that, that scene just kind of popped into my mind when I was listening to this presentation about the historical backdrop of, or this part of the presentation about the historical backdrop of Philippine railways. So it's, it's interesting to think about uh, back, back at, at the turn of the century, basically we had a, we had this railway network. So it's interesting. Um, actually, even, even after World War II, we had the first elevated rail rail system in Southeast Asia. So LRT1 was actually commissioned in 1983. So so there was there was there's been there had been some historical context to us having railways, but uh, as Mr. Batan pointed out, uh, since then we've actually been let uh, net losing um, kilometers in terms of railway coverage of the Philippines. He did not elaborate as as to why, uh, but I, I guess I'm assuming I'm assuming things like just uh, not being maintained and things like that. I'm assuming. But I mean, regardless, we're now we're, we're now currently stuck with 77 kilometers of operational railway, and again, at its height, we had 2,300 kilometers of operational railway. So, 
as he said, there's a lot of catching up for the Philippines to do, for the government to do in terms of building a, 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 um, a decent railway network in the Philippines and in Metro Manila. Uh, what the Duterte administration is uh, planning is um, nine, in, in terms of Metro Manila, they're planning nine lines in the area, including two, two of those nine lines are actually subways in addition to uh, two uh, longer Philippine National Railways that would be cutting across the entire Metro Manila. So that's, that's, that's their plan. And I want to get into that a bit later, but I just want to go over a few other things that uh, Mr. Batan went over, uh, some other interesting details before I actually launch into more details on the actual layout of, of the planned um, uh, railway system in Metro Manila. By the way, I actually took photos of the presentation, and, and I know some of you are watching on the podcast, uh, but I'm going to minimize myself here. I'm sorry, I, I know a few are, are listening on the audio only, but he, there was actually a slide which I'm showing here on the video, but it's basically a, a picture of the different railways that the government's planning. And well, this is a public presentation, so I'm assuming it's safe for me to post on my website. So. I will leave a link uh, on the de in the details for this uh, vi for this video and podcast, so you can click on the link and you can all post the, this picture as well. So it's just to, just to give you some context as to what the government is planning. Okay. Anyways, um, yeah. So you see a bunch of uh, subways here. So anyways, going back to some a few other a few other details that uh, the undersecretary was talking about in this presentation. Um, he spent a good part of the first. And maybe 20 minutes, 30 minutes of the presentation talking about financing for these projects. And um, my experience is that talking about the details of financing, although it's interesting to me because I'm from a finance background, for the most for most people it's just kind of like blah. So I just want to go over it really quickly. Uh, a large chunk of the planned railway network is to be financed by government loans uh, from from foreign governments. Um, I, I believe the two main lenders, or two major lenders, are China and Japan, and they're giving, uh, they're giving the ter the terms, uh, the terms of the loans that they're giving to the Philippine government for these for the railway build out is very very low, um, so that's good for the government. Um, he uh, Batan did mention that previous. The funding for previous attempts at infrastructure build out before was with a uh, with the private sector, meaning with banks rather than, rather than other governments, and the interest rates were higher. Um, but he he did talk about sort of the pros and cons of these different financing schemes. I mean, with a with a private sector or bank financing, which was done previously, the interest rates are higher, but you're accountable to private institutions, whereas. Basically, if it's a government to government, I mean, who knows really where those where those funds are are really being used? So, I mean, that's 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 always sort of the consideration whether the funds are. My interpretation of what he was saying was that whether the funds are are being used uh, correctly. But his uh, his rationale was that, or the government's rationale and his explanation of it was that these funds, I mean, at the low interest rates. Sorry, excuse me. At low interest rates that the government can borrow from from foreign governments like China and Japan, it sort of frees up the other the other uh, money or the other funds that the government has to other to other government projects or obligations. So, or other government spending initiatives. So, that's that's their rationale basically, or one of the major rationales for them to take to, to take the route of uh, government to government lending basically. So that's that's all, that's basically what I talk about with finance because anything else was gonna bore <laughs> a lot of people. But I can go on and on about this, but no, I won't. <laughs> I want to keep this short because it's it's like almost one thirty in the morning and I want to sleep. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. Going into the more of the details about the actual planned build out for. For this railway network, I don't. But, but but by the way, I don't believe he gave any specific dates. But I did read in the news that uh, the government, the government is planning to. Was it the, the government or the or or one of its lenders was planning to have 
one of the subways ready, partially ready by 2020, but that's that's pretty soon. So I don't know if that's going to happen. But he, um, Mr. Batet himself in this presentation get, didn't give any hard deadlines, but he did go into sort of the a little bit of the, of the nuts and bolts of building of building out this railway network. Um, the issue that the government has with building it out and, and my interpretation of what he's saying is that this is going to be a very difficult project in some aspects is that Manila is situated it's a very narrow corridor north to south so obviously on the west side you have you have <clears throat> Manila Bay and on the east you have Laguna de Bay for example so if you, even if you look at the a map of Manila, it's sort of scrunched between these two bodies of water. So there's a very, it's sort of like the the, the networks kind of have to the rail networks networks are all kind of smushed together in that sense because of the sort of the the narrow cor corridor that they're working with for Metro Manila. And it has to be, of course, since the since these bodies of water are in the west and the east. The a lot of the majority the the long the long running uh, uh, rail lines uh, sorry <laughs> rail lines would be from north to th north to south. So the backbone that the government is planning is to have three extensive north to south railways, with the rest being feeder lines, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, mm. Yeah, well, I mean. I'll actually talk about it now. Uh, the north to south, th these three lines, basically one of them is, a, is one of the subways that they're planning is going to be a huge uh, north to south uh, connector line. Sorry, yeah, north to south line. Uh, another will be uh, another will be the, the PNR railway. So I mentioned that earlier. The, 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 this is one of the railways in addition to in addition to the nine lines that are being planned. Um, and uh, there'll be a, another one called uh, Line 1 is what they're planning to do is to, is have it, is to be another Line 1 out of the nine uh, proposed lines is going to be another major north to south connector. So the other lines, uh, Line 2, 3, et cetera, et cetera, are going to be feeder lines that are some of them. If, if you look, at, if you can see this, if you can see the map that I'm showing in this video, there some of them are kind of east to west. So those the, the other lines are going to be feeder lines connecting to the north, these major north and south lines. So that's uh, again th that's because the government has to work with this tight, this tight um, this tight layout for the uh, in terms of Manila's geography okay so he, at the end of the presentation Mr. Batan did mention that even though rail is very sexy and we all want it and we all want better service etc um, he did mention that at, at based on their modeling on their on their projections at, at their most optimistic projections, railway would only capture at most about 25 to 30 percent of public transportation. So it helps, but it's not the cure-all for the tra for traffic. It's not the cure-all for traffic that we're all hoping for. So we did talk about um, PUV modernization, and it's not just a, that's not just fleet upgrades. So when you think of PUVs like buses, jeepneys, uh, et cetera, it's not just uh, modern versions of, of those vehicles. But also, he also talked about route rationalization. So just effective, basically effective use of, of what we currently have. Um, and making sure that certain roads are being plied by certain PUVs and not others. So, so there has to be a sort of efficient use of the roads basically is another way to free up traffic essentially so he also did mention something about uh making sure that he wanted to put up let me see this is actually my other notes but i wanted i just realized now i should probably add this that the government's planning to also establish a philippine rail institute um, basically to prevent problems that we're having right now, like the MRT three problem, for example, making sure that things are better maintained. So those are the, so those are some of the interesting points. So those are basically those are basically the 
the key points to this to this presentation um, my thoughts are and this this brings me back to my analyst days because I used to attend these kinds of presentations all the time um, I, I guess I mean it sounds fair it sounds interesting I doubt anything will be up by 2020 that's really hard he did uh, Mr. but I mean to his, to his credit Mr. Batan did also mention that some of the build outs gonna be difficult like because of the for the for those of you who don't know the the, the roads that actually a lot of the major roads in Metro Manila are based on a radial system with Rizal Park as the center and then rate these other roads rating outwards so it's going to be it's going to be difficult to build with the, with that existing road work on uh, existing basically. Um, it's just hard because we're just kind of building things one on top or below each other. I, I think obviously the PUV the root rationalization is also something the one of the ways to go. Um, I wonder though about the financing. I mean. Obviously, those are really low interest rates, but I hope the government is going to it's, it's going to execute and get this done. Even if it's not by 2020, I hope something, at least we have something to show for all, for all of this. And even, even if things don't pan out, at least we're moving forward. And that's obviously, and for those of you who, who have been listening to the past few episodes, that's, what I'm, that's the message that I've been um, repeating over and over is that there has to be policy continuation. So even though, even after Duterte, whoever becomes president, at least this thing continues. Like I, I would hate for, I would hate for this to start. Like say they start, they start digging and everything, and all of a sudden, it stopped because of whatever political reasons. So I hope all of us can at least be united in in terms of supporting whatever administration is in in, uh, in terms of, at the very least, in terms of building out the infrastructure that we so desperately need. Uh, that's it for today. Uh, I'll see you all, you guys and girls, next week. Uh, before I go, today's Spanish Tagalog vocabulary is for train, the English word train, tren in Tagalog and tren in Espanol. So it's the same, tren, train, tren. Um, okay, that's it. Have a good day, guys. See you next week.